Let me go ahead and very briefly introduce our speaker, who is Dr. Mike Pollan, a Bachelor in Science from UC Davis, a PhD from Arizona State University. He then went on to a postdoc at the Cascades Volcano Observatory, where he experienced his very first eruption, which was when uh, one of the times at Mount St. Helens reawoke in 2004. In 2005, he moved to the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory where he was a research geodesist uh, for 10 years. And you can look up geodesist and figure out what that is. Uh, he moved back to the uh, Cascade Volcanoes Observatory in, two, in 2015. He's been there, he's still there. Um, 2017 though, he um, followed Jake Lowenstern who we've had uh, several times in the past uh, X number of years. So he became then the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory scientist in charge, which is what he is right now amongst many other things, I'm sure. His primary research interests are in volcano deformation. That's a clue about geodesist, uh, satellite remote sensing, gravity change, and eruption forecasting. So without further ado, I'm then going to ask you uh, to join me in welcoming Mike Pollan. Mike, you're up. Well, thanks a lot, John. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here uh, this evening. This is actually the second time we've, we've tried to do this. Uh, the first time was in January of 2019, and you might remember that we had a over month long government shutdown back then, and I wasn't allowed to travel and I wasn't allowed to to go and do anything that was vaguely official. So we had to cancel that one, unfortunately. Um, and uh, of course, now we have a global pandemic, but fortunately, through the magic of Zoom and all these other tools, I can at least be here to uh, to share some, some neat things about, about Yellowstone. So thank you all very much for, for having me. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased to finally be able to, to make it. So let me see if I can share my screen here. All right, how does that look? Okay, so my goal today is to tell you a little bit about what the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory is, uh, what we do, the kinds of monitoring we do, the sorts of results we've gotten. And then I wanna focus on two things that I think are, are really pretty extraordinary, very neat. And the first is the reawakening of Steamboat Geyser, which I'm sure a great many of you have, have heard about. The world's tallest geyser putting on a, a show over the last, uh, over two years now um, in Yellowstone, almost three years. And then I also wanna tell you a little bit about a new thermal area that just was discovered a couple of years ago at Yellowstone, and uh, we, we actually saw this growing out of the trees uh, over time. And it, it's, a, it's really a, a spectacular result. I think it's a testament to the, to the neat tools that we have available for, for monitoring. Um, and then I want to close out uh, the presentation with a little bit about how we communicate some of this information uh, from the Volcano Observatory to you, so you can see some of the products we have out there and, uh, and some of the, uh, shall we say, the neat uh, amusing interpretations that some spin has been put on our on our messaging, which is fun and, and sad, but eh, mostly funny. So, um, so let's dive in. What I'll say first is uh, is really what the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory is not. Um, when I think of a volcano observatory, I think of, of this this right here. The, the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory to me is kind of the, the prototypical example. This is the old facility. Unfortunately, this facility was destroyed by activity in, in 2018, but it was perched right on the rim of Kilauea Caldera. It was operated by the US Geological Survey. It has a tower. I mean, it is a literal observatory where they were looking down into the crater of Kilauea Caldera. So this is sort of the, the, the stereotypical view of a volcano observatory. Well, YVO is, is totally different. The Yellowstone Volcano Survey does not have a facility at all. It is, is there's no building, there's no, there's no place with the, the name YVO on the, on, the, on the marquee. And YVO is also not exclusively run by the US Geological Survey. That may be something that, that a lot of folks think, but in fact, YVO was founded in 2001 as a consortium between the University of Utah which did all of this great seismic monitoring, was getting into to deformation monitoring, geologic mapping in Yellowstone, and the National Park Service, which of course had been looking at hydrothermal activity in Yellowstone for decades. Now, over the years, this has expanded into a consortium of nine institutions. So we are now not just USGS, Utah, and the National Park Service, but also the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology, the Wyoming State Geological Survey, the Idaho Geological Survey, 
UNAVCO, that's a group that's in Boulder, Colorado, that studies how the ground moves, deformation throughout the Western United States, including Yellowstone, uh, the University of Wyoming, and most recently, uh, just last year, Montana State University joined our consortium. And they have incredible expertise in uh, the biology of thermal features and also in mapping some of the really large explosive eruptions that have occurred in Yellowstone. So it's not just the USGS. In fact, uh, the other consortium members bring even more staff to the effort of monitoring and understanding Yellowstone volcanic activity and, and seismic activity. It's, it's very much a, a, a fun team to be a part of. And that makes it somewhat unique among the observatories, having this many people participating. Now, our mission, I would distill down into to three elements. The first is research into volcanic, tectonic, and hydrothermal processes in the Yellowstone region, the science, trying to understand uh, what's going on in, in the Yellowstone area in terms of volcanic, hydrothermal, and tectonic activity. The second is monitoring, looking at earthquake and volcanic activity in and around Yellowstone, relating this especially to volcanic and seismic hazards. And third, I think getting this information out there, it, it really doesn't mean much if we hold it all inside and, and don't share all of this really amazing information. So education and outreach about Yellowstone geologic past, present, and, and even its future, I think is, is key uh, to what we do. So it's, a, it's certainly an important part of our mission. How do we go about accomplishing uh, these goals? A huge part of that is through the monitoring networks that YVO operates. So this is, uh, takes many, many forms, the, the type, type of monitoring we do, but I think the, the very first thing that probably comes to mind for most people is seismic monitoring, right? Looking at earthquake activity. We all know that Yellowstone is one of the most seismically active areas in the United States, especially if, if you're living in the Jackson area, you probably felt an earthquake or two. Now, the University of Utah handles all of this seismic monitoring. They locate all of the earthquakes and maintain much of the equipment in the region. There's 46 seismic stations in and around Yellowstone and many of those stations have multiple channels, multiple ways of recording data. So that in all, there's over a hundred channels of data that are being collected that are helping us locate earthquakes and identify uh, how they occur, why they occur, what they may be indicating. In this photo here, you can actually see one of the founders of the Volcano Observatory, uh, Dr. Bob Smith from the University of Utah showing one of these seismic stations that's uh, it's buried in the ground in the Yellowstone region. So seismic monitoring, certainly key we also look at how the ground moves, deformation monitoring. This is the, the area that I, I really spend a lot of time, time thinking about in my own research. Now, deformation at Yellowstone is mostly looked at by means of global positioning system stations. You literally take a GPS station and you cement it to the ground and you radio that information on a continuous basis out of the area so that it gets processed by universities and, and facilities. UNAVCO right now, that agency in Boulder that maps deformation all of the US, they operate the deformation network, the GPS networks in the Yellowstone area. In fact, the University of Utah started by putting these things in and then UNAVCO assumed that responsibility. And there's over 15 continuous GPS stations in the park that are always reporting back their position so we can see how the ground is moving. And those are the green dots on this map right here. The red dots are temporary GPS stations that we go out and deploy every May after the snow melts, and then we pick them up in October before winter really sets in. And you can see it, it really densifies the network we have. So we have a variety of ways of getting this sort of information uh, about how the ground moves back to the laboratories. It's not just about seismic and deformation, we also look at river chemistry. Now it turns out that all of these thermal areas in and around Yellowstone produce a tremendous amount of chloride. Most of the chloride in Yellowstone's rivers comes out of the thermal areas. Those thermal areas dump their water into a river, and so the rivers actually act like a collection and a delivery system for this chloride. So there are monitoring stations in Yellowstone that are specifically tasked with measuring just how much chloride is in the river systems over time. This map right here shows the green stations, which are chloride stations that are connected by radio, so they're constantly radioing their information out. And then these red stations, which we have to actually go to and, and download the, the information. But you can see we've got the major rivers covered. And one of the, the stations near, uh, this is on Tantalus Creek in this picture right here, which is, is near the Norris Geyser Basin. Here's one of these areas that measures not just the amount of chloride in the system, but also just how much water is passing through this area. So we can look at changes in water flux. 
Well, if we look at all the chloride coming out of Yellowstone, we can actually figure out where it's mostly coming from. The Madison and the Yellowstone rivers dominate in terms of the total amount of chloride. And that's not too surprising because of course, the Madison is draining all of these big geyser basins on the west side of the park, Norris, upper middle and, and lower geyser basins. Whereas the Yellowstone is draining everything on the eastern side of the park. And then the Snake River and the Falls River are, are draining these, these sort of small areas in the south and the southwest part of the park. So of course, most of the chloride we see is in the, is in the big rivers that are really draining the big, the big geyser basins. And we can monitor this over time and look for changes. And that can be an indication of whether or not there's a change in thermal activity. Of course, we also take samples. Now, gas samples, water samples, the, the picture here, the person's hand is collecting gas sample and it's being stored in uh, an evacuated little, little uh, uh, glass, glass storage uh, uh, storage sampler here. And then we can also, we're starting to dabble in this, measure gases continuously. And this is pretty hard in Yellowstone because if you've been there, you know gas is coming out of just about every place in the park. So it's, uh, it's really sort of an experimental uh, uh, technique that we've been trying out over the last few years to measure different types of gases. And in the photo here, we have a, a station called an eddy covariance station. That's this station right here. That's measuring carbon dioxide. It's sort of a, a meteorological technique. And then this one on the ground called a multi-gas station, which is able to measure different types of gas species. And so we've deployed these in various areas to test how they work uh, in the idea of, or in, the, in the, the, the plan is that hopefully we'll be able to deploy more of these in the future to monitor gas emissions in, in many parts of Yellowstone. But for now, most of the gas testing we do is actually going to a place and, and taking samples. There, of course, is also remote sensing using satellite data. Tracking thermal activity is incredibly important, of course, right? Anyone that's, that's been there knows that that's really the characteristic of Yellowstone. So we have this, this map right now with all these red areas, and those red areas are thermal features that have been recognized not only by people going and visiting them, but also by looking at thermal satellite data. And that's what you're seeing right here on the right is a thermal image of Yellowstone. In this thermal image, anything that's cool is a dark color and anything that's warmer is a lighter color. And we can zoom in, for example, on the Norris Geyser Basin, you can see some of the detail in this, that there are hot and cool or warm and cool areas uh, within a, 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 a small area like Norris. Some areas are warm and some areas are cool. And if we can, the nice thing about the, the, the satellite images, we can add up all of the thermal output that we can see through all of Yellowstone, if we do that, this particular image, which was acquired in, I think, 2019, we get 1.3 gigawatts of geothermal radiative power output from the entire park. And if you're my age or a little older, you might know that this is more than enough energy to send a DeLorean back in time to 1955. So Yellowstone is putting out just a tremendous amount of heat, and we can see that heat from space. Of course, we also have temperature monitoring equipment on the ground as well. This is an example of that. Uh, a, a network that we deployed at the Norris Geyser Basin. So this is a zoom of Norris Geyser Basin and all of those yellow labels are places that we have temperature monitoring stations. And these are actually connected to the internet. And once a day, all of this temperature monitoring uh, data is uploaded to the internet. So you can actually go to the YVO website and see the records for various, various geyser features in the Norris area. It's pretty neat. I, I've put an example up here from Echinus Geyser in 2017 you can see it sort of, you know, follows uh, along here with, you know, warm temperatures. Of course, it's a, it's a geyser pool, but there isn't a whole lot of activity until we get to September, October, and then November, this huge variability. And if we were to zoom in on that, say one day at the beginning of November, that's what it looks like. This was a period when Echinus started to erupt about every two hours. And this activity only lasted for a couple of months before it went back to sleep. You can see sort of what it looked like before an eruption, this nice pool that I think many of us are familiar with if you've been to the Norris area. And then after eruption, it, 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 uh, it drained a little bit. So this was a time period where you kind of came back to life and then quieted down again. And we can track this even when there aren't people at, at Norris because obviously in the winter, much of the park is closed uh, thanks to this uh, telemeter, this radio connected temperature monitoring network. So something we have operating at Norris and that you can, you can see yourself on, on the website. All right, so that's a bit about how we monitor Yellowstone. Let's talk about why Yellowstone is there and what sort of hazards we are dealing with in the region. 
So I think many of you probably know that Yellowstone is a hotspot. Uh, this is an area of anomalous melting in the upper part of Earth's mantle, maybe at the top of a, a plume of hot material that's rising from deep within the Earth. But however it happens, there is sort of a melting anomaly uh, in, in, the, in the upper part of Earth's mantle, lower part of the crust. And it's relatively stationary. So of course now the tectonic plates that make up the surface of the Earth are not stationary. And so you can have a plate moving across the top of this hotspot. And the hotspot is generating magma that can punch through the plate as it's moving along. So it's a bit like having a, a blowtorch underneath a, a, a metal plate that's, that's moving across this, this blowtorch and it punches through every so often. And we can track this pretty easily back about 17 million years or so. And, and that leads us to a caldera system that's sort of at the junction between Oregon and Nevada and the Idaho area. And over time, as the plate moved to the Southwest, the North American plate moved to the Southwest, we saw a series of caldera systems. They get younger and younger as you move to the Northeast towards Yellowstone. And the Yellowstone system really has been going for about uh, 2.1 million years, generated three large caldera systems. And you can see it sort of uh, mirrors what's been going on in these previous calderas. We're seeing sort of uh, the modern version of what it might have looked like around Twin Falls or so uh, 10, to, 10 to 12 million years ago. Well, that's resulted in a magmatic system beneath Yellowstone today that looks something like this. And this is based on seismic imaging that's been done by scientists at the University of Utah. They've been able to recognize by looking at how seismic waves are passing through the subsurface that there is a, a two-tiered magma system beneath modern-day Yellowstone caldera. The upper part is a very viscous magma, uh, but it's mostly solid. There's only about 5 to 15 percent of that is actually molten. And below that, at you know, 20 to 50 kilometer depth or so, is another uh, magma system that's a little less viscous. Uh, it's made out of basaltic magma. And that though, that particular reservoir is only about two to 5% magma. So this magmatic system beneath Yellowstone is generated by this, this heat, uh, this hot spot that may be sitting atop this plume of hot material. And it's beneath modern day Yellowstone caldera now. And this is the heat engine that powers all of the things that we're seeing at the surface. Even though it's mostly solid, it's still very, very hot. And that's what gives us the, the really spectacular features we see at the surface today. So how does that drive the hazards that we see in Yellowstone? Well, there's a whole plethora of, of hazards from the really, really extreme to the really quite, quite small, almost everyday hazards. Let's start with the extreme ones, right? Those are the big caldera forming eruptions. There have been three of these really large explosions in the last 2.1 million years. This very large green circle here, that's the Huckleberry Ridge caldera, the first caldera of the Yellowstone system that was 2.1 million years ago. This smaller circle right here is the Henry's Fork caldera uh, in Idaho. That was about 1.3 million years ago. And then the modern Yellowstone caldera is this purple uh, outline right there. And that formed about 631,000 years ago. We've actually done simulations of what a modern eruption of Yellowstone caldera might look like today. And that's what you're seeing here with this uh, colored graph there. It, it's a map of the ash fall that might be expected from a large explosive eruption. And one of the neat things that came out of this simulation, this is sort of based on the physics of how ash works in the atmosphere, is that usually these atmospheric plumes that come out of volcanoes are really pushed around by the wind. There's a lot of wind and they you know, blow in a certain direction. Uh, some of you might remember the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980. All of that ash basically went off to the east. But a Yellowstone big explosion might be so powerful that it basically ignores wind and you would end up getting an umbrella cloud that sort of went in, in all directions. And that's why this particular uh, ash deposition map right here, this simulation, doesn't have any real directionality to a little bit of it off to the east, but it's mostly a, really a, a bullseye centered on the Yellowstone region. So that's a, a testament just to how big these large explosive eruptions might be. But there's, there's only been a few of these in the last few million years. What's more common in terms of volcanic eruptions are lava flows. So you've got a map of the post caldera lava flows here on the left. All of these colored uh, areas are lava flows that have erupted since the formation of Yellowstone caldera. The orange ones are lava flows that came out in a little pulse 
600,000 years ago or so. And then it was pretty quiet until about 170,000 years ago. And, and for about a 100,000 year period, from about 170,000 years ago to 70,000 years ago, all of these pink lava flows came out of the ground. This forms some of the really spectacular cliff-like features that you can see driving around Yellowstone. Some of the, the, the canyons are made up actually of lava flows that have come up against the, the caldera walls. You can see these when you're standing at Old Faithful and looking off to the east, there's some tall cliffs and those are lava flows. In fact, there's lava flows sort of bounding all around the Old Faithful area. Uh, you can see into the guts of some of these lava flows when you're at the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. That's what's in this picture here. And this very light colored material is the interior of this rhyolite lava flow. These are huge lava flows, not like anything coming out of Hawaii. Uh, many, 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 a hundred times bigger than the volume that came out of, of Mount St. Helens, say. Really large lava flows, a uh, very thick, uh, maybe many, uh, many hundreds of feet thick. And then they have these very brightly lit uh, interiors because of all this alteration that can occur after they are formed. So Yellowstone lava flows are, are much more common. There's been 20 or 30 of these since the last big explosive eruption. Yellowstone is also chocked full of faults. So these, these black lines are some of the mapped faults in the region, all over the place. And of course, if you have lots of faults, you have lots and lots of earthquakes. So this is just a, a map of some of the stronger seismicity that's occurred in the area. There have been two really large earthquakes that have occurred in, uh, in historic time. One was the Hebgen Lake earthquake, a 7.3, that occurred just outside the western boundary of the park. And then in the Norris area in 1975, there was a magnitude 6.1. That's the largest recorded earthquake in the boundary of the park. So there's earthquakes all over the Yellowstone area. It's one of the, the most seismically active parts of the country. We typically locate somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 to 2,500 earthquakes every year. So a lot of seismicity. It's, it always cracks me up when you see a, a, you know, some headline that's, you know, oh, there were 100 earthquakes in Yellowstone uh, this past month. I think, well, yeah, of course there were. That's exactly what it should be doing. It's what it's always been doing. A lot of activity there. Another perhaps underappreciated hazard in the Yellowstone region are hydrothermal explosions. Now these are basically uh, water flashing to steam and some of them are really quite impressively large. Uh, some of the largest ones we've got mapped out here are these orange stars um, scattered especially on the north side of Yellowstone Lake but you can find them all the way even north of the Norris area and over the lower geyser basin by West Thumb. Here's an example of one of those hydrothermal explosions look like some of the biggest ones are really really immense. Mary Bay on the north side of Yellowstone Lake, right in this area here, is a mile and a half across and is the largest known steam explosion, hydrothermal explosion, anywhere in the world. It's right there in, in Yellowstone. But also we have much smaller ones. This is in the Lower Geyser Basin area. This is actually a, a hydrothermal explosion that Bob Smith witnessed. Uh, it happened over his shoulder during a, a field trip. These kinds of explosions are basically just geysers on steroids. Uh, and they happen maybe once a year or two. Uh, often they happen in, in backcountry areas where we don't really uh, see much evidence of them. But every now and then there's one that'll happen in the front country. Uh, and a good example of that is a 1989 pork chop geyser in, in the Norris Geyser Basin. Uh, that had a, an explosion through rocks in, in many places and left a, a small crater. So these things do happen uh, in, in areas where, where tourists tend to, to be. So to sum up this sort of look at, at the hazards of Yellowstone, we can go sort of plot it on this graph, more frequent on the, the y-axis and the vertical axis and more destructive on the horizontal axis. And the most destructive, but least frequent sorts of things are these big caldera forming eruptions. You get one, maybe two per million years. And the last one was about 631,000 years ago. Now, slightly less destructive and slightly more frequent are these really big lava flows. They aren't accompanied by big explosions, but we get this lava flow activity, there's maybe 20 or 30 of them since the last caldera, big caldera forming eruption. The most recent one was 70,000 years ago. Maybe on average you get 100 or so per million years, uh, give or take. Strong earthquakes are the most likely kind of big hazard we're going to see on human time scales. I already mentioned the, the big ones in the 1959 magnitude 7.3 heavy lake event where over two dozen people were killed in the Madison River Canyon just outside the park due to a, a, a big landslide 
that area that created Quake Lake, as I'm sure many of you know and have visited. And then the 1975 6.1 Norris event. So strong earthquakes uh, are, are a huge hazard in the, in the whole Yellowstone region, uh, just because of the consequences of the, the tectonic activity in the Western US. These aren't really related to the volcanic activity in Yellowstone. And then we've got these hydrothermal explosions. You can have the really, really big ones, which have been a couple dozen or so since Yellowstone called there, or since the, uh, in the last uh, few thousand years. And then there's these small ones uh, like pork chop geyser, which blew up in 1989, which can happen every year or two or so. So we may get several of these per century, some of the, the bigger ones, um, but they're sort of an underappreciated hazard, but a, a consequence of having all this boiling water right beneath the park. So that's a little bit about how we monitor Yellowstone, what makes Yellowstone special, and, and the hazards that we're especially cognizant of, that we're really paying a lot of, a lot of attention to. So with that in mind, let's dive into current activity in the Yellowstone area. 2020 was actually a pretty typical year for Yellowstone. This is a map of the earthquakes that were located by the University of Utah. Uh, over the entire year, they got 1,718 earthquakes, all these red dots. And that's incredibly average for Yellowstone. It sounds like a lot, but remember, Yellowstone's average seismicity is somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 to 2,500 earthquakes every year. And there were a couple swarms as well. Uh, little clusters of earthquakes in space and time, they're, they're tightly clustered, uh, are down here near Hart Lake and then right here in Yellowstone Lake and in various other places. And in fact, about 50% of all Yellowstone earthquakes occur in these swarms, these little clusters of earthquakes that are happen uh, in the same place at roughly the uh, short period of time between them. And sure enough, in 2020, about 50% of all the earthquakes were in these swarms. Well, let's talk a little bit about deformation as well. What's been happening in terms of the ground rising up and down? I, I occasionally see people saying, well, the ground is uplifting at Yellowstone. Well, the ground actually goes up and down quite a lot. And we have all these GPS stations all over the place to show us exactly what's happening. This is from a GPS station that's on the east side of the caldera near White Lake. This is vertical deformation since 2003. So whenever you see this go up, that's uplift. And then when it goes down, that's the ground sinking, that's subsidence. So 2004 up to 2009 or so, we had uplift. And then 2009, 2010, down to 2014, we had subsidence and a little bit of uplift in 2014, 2015. And then ever since 2015, we've had subsidence. And 2020 was, was really just continuing the trends that we'd seen since 2015. So how about the other side of the caldera near Old Faithful? Same thing. This is a GPS station that's located just above Old Faithful. We have that same uplift, subsidence, uplift, subsidence over the last 20 years or so. And these, these really show that the caldera is sort of acting in concert. It's a bit different when you go to the Norris Geyser Basin, not following the caldera trends at all. We had subsidence at the beginning of this and really nothing through the late 2000s and early 2010s. And then 2013, 2014, look at that rapid uplift there was a magnitude 4.7 earthquake right at this peak, and then down it went. Stayed low for a little bit, and then we started seeing uplift again that lasted until 2018, and then it sort of turned around a bit in 2019, and throughout 2020, there wasn't much deformation at Norris. So Norris acts a bit differently than the rest of Yellowstone. It's an incredibly dynamic place, and this is one of the things that I find really compelling about working in Yellowstone, being a, a geologist that gets to spend time there is that it's always changing. It's always doing interesting things. There was a couple of geologists that characterized this up and down motion as actually breathing of Yellowstone, which I, I think is a, is a really neat concept. And you know, we know at some point, even though Yellowstone is subsiding now, at some point it will turn back around and, and start uplifting again, because that's what it does. It goes up and it goes down over time. I wanted to zoom in on the Norris area and show a little bit more deformation there because I think the sort of story that comes out of Norris is, is really pretty spectacular. To really understand Norris, we've used a technique called INSAR. This stands for Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar. Sounds fancy. It's really just using satellite radar to get a map of how the ground moves. We can actually basically use radar from space to take a picture of ground deformation. And this is what one of those pictures looks like. This is, there's the caldera. This pattern of fringes that's sort of within the caldera 
indicates that the caldera is subsiding. And this pattern of fringes right here around the Norris area, just north of the caldera, indicates that Yellowstone is going up. We can look at the sense of color to determine that. You can see going into the bullseye here, you've got sort of blue, red, yellow, whereas into the bullseye here, you've got blue, well, yellow, blue, huh, sorry, yellow, red, blue. It's the opposite. The, so the sense of color as you go into the bullseye tells you whether the ground is going up or down. And in this case, we know that the ground here is going down in the caldera and up at Norris. This matches what we saw from GPS. Well, let's zoom in on the Norris area specifically. There's that image from 2016 to 2017. It was moving up. Go back a little bit. 2015 to 2016, it was still going up. This is the image from 2014. At this time, it was actually going down. But you can see in all of these cases, it's relatively confined to the Norris area. Well, this is what it looked like way back when, 1996 to 2000, a much larger pattern of uplift that really dominated the entire area. If you can compare that to what we saw, for example, from 2016 to 2017. What we think was happening in the Norris area was back in 1996 to 2000, there was actually an intrusion of magma. And we think that based on the, the shape of the deformation, it occurred about 10 miles beneath the surface. Now, when magma comes into an area, it's not just molten rock. It carries dissolved water and gases in it as well. And over time, as the magma slowly cools, the water and the gas wants to get out. It doesn't really want to be in this cooling magma body. And so that might be what we saw at Norris was in 1996 and 2000, a very deep intrusion of magma. This probably happens all the time. It's just that we can see it now. This is what's keeping the systems, the hydrothermal systems alive. And then over time, that water and gas migrated up towards the surface. And so that might have been what was driving these little ups and downs of Norris since, which are more tightly focused, which suggests that stuff was happening a little bit more shallowly. That's not magma, but hot water and gas that's coming off a magma body that may be 20, 30 years old. So using deformation, we can get a really neat look at what's happening in these areas. And, and Norris, I think, is one of the most dynamic areas in the entire park, both based on deformation and all the, the spectacular activity. Well, speaking of Norris, how can we not talk about Steamboat Geyser, right? Steamboat, tallest geyser in the world. When it erupts, it erupts a volume that's something like 10 times what Old Faithful puts out. So it's utterly spectacular. The eruptions can go three or 400 feet high. Uh, the water phase of the eruption, which can last tens of minutes, is usually followed by a steam phase. It sounds like a jet engine that can go for a day. It sprang to life in March of 2018. And this is the seismic signal right here that was associated with that very first eruption of the sequence. This is a seismometer that's located in the museum building at Norris that the, the University of Utah operates. You can see it gets sort of this line gets really, really thick here, this dark blue line, and then it kind of tails away over time. This one of these seismograms here is sort of the, the seismic record for the entire day. And each one of these lines is, is half an hour. So this eruption really was going for about 15 minutes or so, and then it took about an hour before it kind of faded away back to, to background. So this is one of the ways we can look for eruptions of steamboat is by looking at the seismometer, which you can actually grab online. So the 32 eruptions in 2018, that was a record for any given calendar year. And then there were 48 in 2019, another record. And then we equaled that record in 2020 with another 48 eruptions. And it's had a few eruptions uh, since then to start out 2021. There's a couple other ways we can identify steamboat activity as well. One is from one of these temperature sensors that sends its data to the internet. Now this is a photo of steamboat in eruption by one of uh, Jamie Farrell, one of my colleagues from the University of Utah. We have a temperature sensor in this runoff channel. So whenever there's a, an eruption, lots of water comes pouring down the channel and we can detect it as a spike in the temperature network. So this is from an eruption, a pair of eruptions that occurred in December of 2019. There's a buildup, lots and lots of minor eruptive activity, then there's the spike, and then back down to sort of zero. It was uh, December, pretty cold. And then we saw another buildup, there's the spike, the eruption, and then back down to zero. The third way we can monitor it is based on the amount of water that comes out of the Norris area. Here's that water monitoring station that's on Tantalus Creek that captures all water that comes out of Norris. 
And this is for the same time period as the temperature plot above. And there's a spike right there in the amount of water coming through the stream gauge and another spike right there. About 90 minutes after steamboat erupts, we see all that water at the Tantalus stream gauge. So even when something malfunctions, the seismometer goes down or the temperature network goes down or we lose power to something, there's multiple ways for us to track the eruptive activity of steamboat guys. And all of this is available online. So you can, you can track the activity for yourself if you like. Now, this is another video and, and an aerial view that, uh, that Jamie provided, which I think shows really the, the power of, of this eruptive activity. There's the jet of steamboat going off. We happen to be lucky enough to catch it. And this is an aerial view of this, the Norris area. This is a kindness geyser down here. Steamboat is right here. And there's Cistern Spring, which I'll talk about in a second, just down below. But you can see this sort of area of kind of dusty vegetation. Well, all of these trees are spattered with kind of silica mud that's been shooting out of Steamboat Geyser and most of it directed in, in this, this way here. This is the parking area up at, at Steamboat Geyser and the museum building is, is down here. Now, maybe some of you have been lucky enough to see Steamboat erupt. Maybe some of you have been unlucky enough to have been parked in this area here when Steamboat erupted. Uh, it really drops a lot of silica mud on, on cars. And in fact, there's now warning signs in the, in the parking lot that say, steamboat erupts, your car is going to get dirty, and it's, it's pretty nasty. Uh, and you can see that very well, how, how repeated eruptions of steamboat have, have done a number on the vegetation in this area there. It also affects some other features in the region. So this is Cistern Spring. And Cistern has this tendency to drain when steamboat erupts and then refill. So we know steamboat, you know, 10 times the volume of an old faithful eruption must be tapping a huge area of, of, of water that's, that's in the subsurface. So this is what cistern looked like right about the time that steamboat started to erupt in 2019 when I happened to be visiting. The next day, that's what cistern looked like, completely drained. Over the next few days, it comes back and it repeats this all the time. So you can actually get a sense of whether or not steamboat has erupted just by looking at cistern if it's empty, you know it's probably erupted within the last 24 hours, and it gradually refills over the, the, the few days that, that follow. So we know there's some interconnectivity between a few of the features in the steamboat area. Okay, well now the obvious question, right? What's causing these steamboat eruptions, this really spectacular activity? I, I love this plot. This was designed by a, a student, Mara Reed, from University of California, Berkeley, and her team uh, which is a, a group of students that all tried to get together and, and solve this problem of, of what's causing steamboat eruptions. It's gone through other periods of heightened activity. So this is sort of the number of eruptions over time. You can see in the 60s, it had an increase in activity. In the 80s, there was another one. Between these, it has little eruptions here and there. And this is the phase we're in right now. By the end of 2020, there have been 270 recorded eruptions of steamboat. And as sort of a bit of fun, uh, my, my colleague, Jake Lowenstern, who uh, I'm sure is, uh, I know many of you know him, uh, he operated the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory from 2002 or 2003 up to 2017, like 14, 15 years. And so his time of activity was sort of this time period right here. He told me like in his entire uh, tenure of 15 years, there were four or five steamboat eruptions. And in my short tenure of just a few years, I've seen 130. <laughs> so I, I think he, he's a bit jealous. <laughs> and this is what the rates of those eruptions look like over time. You can see what we're doing right now uh, over the last three years. We've seen a really impressive rate of eruptions. This is the red is the, the 60s. Uh, the, the event lasted about seven years with 85 eruptions. The 80s, over three eruptions, there were about uh, three years, there were about 40 eruptions. And we had over 128, 130 now in three years. So the rate of eruptions is really impressive. Well, maybe it's that there's more groundwater in the area. Well, this, this team uh, led by, by Mara Reed was able to look at groundwater conditions and say, no, there's nothing special about groundwater conditions. It wasn't that there was more water available during these times. Well, maybe it's more rain or more snow. Well, in fact, we have very good records of that. It wasn't more rain or snow. Maybe it's earthquake activity, right? There are earthquake swarms all the time. There was a very large one in 2017 but they were able to look at the amount of shaking that was caused by these earthquake swarms. And guess what? That's not causing it either. How about ground deformation? I just pointed out all this neat uplift and, and subsidence in the Norris area. 
But that doesn't seem to have caused anything either. It's not happening at the right times. And it's only Steamboat that's affected. If it were something region-wide, you would expect other features in the Norris area to respond just like Steamboat has, but they haven't. What about an increase in temperature? Well, again, you would expect to see more features responding to this. And we can actually look at the chemistry of the water in a place like Cistern and say, you know what, we can tell what the temperature of the water is in the subsurface and there hasn't been a change there. So this kind of might sound a bit unsatisfying that we don't know why Steamboat is going through these, these active phases. But I would actually argue that this is a pretty important result because guess what? We can cross some of these possibilities off the list. And now the number of things that really could be causing Steamboat, it, it's a bit, the, the list is smaller. It probably has something to do with the plumbing system of Steamboat, which has all kinds of minerals precipitated on it. And those plumbing systems, they open, they close based on how water's circulating. That's not something we can see really well at this point, but uh, that, that seems a very likely candidate for what's happening at Steamboat, given that we can cross some of these other things off the list. But we can see some neat little trends. And I, I love this right here. So we can now look at all these you know, 130 odd eruptions that have happened over the last three years. This is the time since the previous eruption, of course, years here on the horizontal axis. And you can see in the summertime, well, we're down about five days between eruptions, but in the winter, might be 10 days. And of course, there's some outliers here and there, but that is repeatable over the years. And so even though the amount of water in the subsurface probably didn't trigger Steamboat into this active phase it's in now, it does seem to control how much time there is between eruptions. Because during the summer, there's a lot of water in the subsurface, all that snow melt. And in the winter, there's a lot less water in the subsurface. So we are able to see some neat trends in Steamboat activity because we have all this, this great data. And I'm hopeful we're gonna see even more coming out of the future, uh, thanks to some neat seismic deployments that the University of Utah has done. They put seismometers all around Steamboat and uh, have looked into the interior doing the seismic imaging technique of the Steamboat area. And I'm excited that, uh, that those results will be coming out soon. And as sort of a, a, a sneak peek at the kinds of things we might expect, I wanted to show you some of their results from Old Faithful. They put out a couple of years in a row, six, uh, 2017, 2018 and so forth, seismometers all around the Old Faithful area. There's Old Faithful, the red star in the middle. All of these yellow dots are seismometers they deployed at a time period when the park was closed in the Novembers. This is a map of where the noise, the seismic noise was coming from over time. And what I'm gonna show is one cycle of an eruption here. There's Old Faithful, the star, and then all of this uh, colored area is sort of pointing back to where all the seismic noise is coming from. So we're getting close to an eruption. Eruption is minute zero. Bang, there's the eruption. All that noise dropped down and now it's rising up towards the surface again. So it's almost as if you can track the location of the boiling water beneath Old Faithful over time. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about the fact that they might be able to apply some of these similar techniques to Steamboat. We might be able to actually see what's going on in the subsurface. All right. Other really neat thing that happened in the Yeltsin area is the discovery of this new thermal area near Turn Lake. And that was made by a colleague of mine named Greg Vaughn, who studies thermal satellite imagery. And this is one of his images right here. And he typically goes through and, and sort of looks at all the thermal areas. And, and this is a zoom in of the east side of the caldera. All of these little red outlines are known thermal areas. They're in the park database. And then of course the blue areas are, are lakes that we know about. Well. He noticed that area right there. It doesn't have a red line around it. So it's not something that the park knew to be an active thermal area. So, huh, I wonder what that is. So he started looking at old aerial photographs of that region. So this kind of whitish area up here is a thermal area that we knew about already, the Turn Lake thermal area. This is Turn Lake down here, the west side of Turn Lake. And I want you to keep your eye on this area right here on the edge of the forest. So that was 1994, looks fine. There's 2003, we can see there's a couple of areas of you know, some vegetation that might not be that healthy. 2006, well, we can start to see a little bit more of that in this area. Wow, look at that, 2009, in just three years, a tremendous amount of the vegetation in that area has, has died away. And then in 2015, looks like a full-fledged thermal. It looks very similar 
to this thermal area up here, which has been around as long as, as people have been visiting the Yellowstone area. We saw the birth of a thermal area in Yellowstone over this 20 year period, starting in about 2000 or so. But we were able to go out in 2019 and visit this area. And this is what it looks like from the air. There's that old thermal area in the background. This is the west side of Turn Lake right here. And there is the new thermal area right there, right in, came out of the trees. One of the things we were able to do when we did the overflight was not only take normal pictures, we could take thermal pictures of the thermal area. And you can see there's a, a, a mix of very warm temperatures. Uh, some of these areas, when we visited on the ground, we saw temperatures that were boiling, basically, just a couple of inches below, below the surface, but right next to very cool areas. You see this, this area right here of, of coolness is that area of vegetation right there. In fact, we found some young trees that were already growing back on the margins of the thermal area. So it was as if when this thing first formed, perhaps in the early 2000s or mid 2000s, it killed off the vegetation in the whole area. And then the hot areas really concentrated. And, and the other parts of that, that thermal area cooled down enough that, that trees could actually come back. And there's, there's many, many young trees uh, on the margins of this. And here's what it looks like from the ground. You can see all these down trees all through the area. And spectacularly, some of the trees that were in contact with the hottest parts of the ground had actually uh, carbonized. They, they actually had a little bit of charcoal. Nothing was combusting. But with those hot temperatures being exposed to the hot temperatures for so long, some of the, some of the trees started to actually uh, uh, carbonize. So a really neat thing that we were able to see uh, as it was, was happening at Yellowstone. Not all thermal areas turn on. This is one of the questions I get pretty, pretty frequently as well. Yellowstone is becoming more active, right? It's, it's getting warmer. Well, remember the ground goes up and down, earthquakes come and go, thermal areas come and go as well. When you're driving through Yellowstone, you may see areas that are white and chalky. Those are old thermal areas that aren't hot anymore. And they change over time. And, and here's a very neat example just from the past year. This is a thermal feature. I think it's informally called Palisades, uh, but it's in the southwest part of Yellowstone. It's in the Ferris Fork of the, of, of the Beckler River. Uh, this is a, a looking down from a helicopter, and this is a view from the trail of the, what this feature looks like. We got a report in 2020 that it appeared to have dried up. So we started looking at satellite images. This is a high resolution satellite image from 2019. There is the feature right there, right along the margin of the river. That's what the feature looks like in 2020. It's dry. In fact, the feature across the river from it too, it looks like it might have dried up as well. So these thermal features are incredibly dynamic. Thermal areas are incredibly dynamic. They come and they go. They heat up and they cool down. And I, I think now we have the technology, we have the, the satellite imagery, the, the ability to see so much of the park that we can start to get a sense of just how often these things change. And the constant in Yellowstone is change. So I'd like to close now by talking a little bit about our communication strategy. This is spectacular stuff, right? Thermal areas coming and going, the tallest guys in the world turning on and turning off, so much going on at Yellowstone. And one of my real passions is making sure that we tell people about this because it's sort of useless to, to know all of this great stuff and, and not share it. But of course, Yellowstone is an exciting place and sometimes the message gets, gets really muddled and I wanted to share what I think is a spectacular example that I, I hope many of you appreciate being from this area. Uh, one of the first things I saw when I started this was a, a headline, Yellowstone Volcano, how Texas City was evacuated after end of the world warning. I thought, Texas? A Texas City? Because what, what are they talking about? Well, we read the first line the city of Ennis in Texas, U.S., was evacuated in the middle of the night after a warning was sent by a local in Yellowstone National Park in 1959. Is it possible that this rag of a, of a, of a periodical means Ennis, Montana? I mean, 1959, there was some, that big earthquake, Hebgen Lake, and there was a concern that if the dam was over top, that Ennis would, would get flooded. Well, I thought, okay, the people that wrote this may, may not be so familiar with the United States. And so I typed in Ennis, just Ennis, to Google. And the first thing that popped up, Ennis, Texas. So whoever wrote this story just typed Ennis into Google and, and, and some city in Texas popped up. And the reason I think 
Ennis, Texas popped up first was because this is home to the National Polka Festival. So my message to Ennis, Montana is we, we got to we got to get you on the map. So maybe the uh, we need to have a national festival of some kind in, in Montana, Ennis, Montana, to, to compete with uh, our, our neighbors down south. Well, this is the sort of thing I wanted to combat. Though. I wanted to put out good information. And my colleagues in all the different institutions of the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory supported this effort to do something that we called Caldera Chronicles. So now, over the last few years, we've been putting out every Monday morning a new story about some aspect of Yellowstone, geology, history, current activity, new research. So if you go to the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory website, off on the left side, there's this link to Caldera Chronicles. And if you go to that, you can see all of these different stories. There's even a way to subscribe and have it delivered to you via email every Monday. And it's always something different and always written by a different scientist or collaborator about Yellowstone activity. It's a way for us to share some of the neat things that are happening, to talk about the new thermal areas, to talk about steamboat activity and, and what that might mean in, in the latest research that we're doing. Sometimes that still goes sideways. And uh, I, I love this one. This was a Caldera Chronicle article that we put out a couple of years ago now, a year and a half ago. How old is Yellowstone's magma reservoir? And the article is about using zircon, which is a mineral that crystallizes from this magma. And zircon contains a bit of uranium. And of course, uranium being a radioactive material decays over time. And, and we can use the uranium content of these zircons to date the time that the, the mineral crystallized. So it's almost like having a little clock sitting in the magma chamber. Well, the take home message by one of these, these rag periodicals was, Yellowstone volcano shock, scorching magma chamber is radioactive. And I, I just love the, the opening of this article. Yellowstone volcano's terrifying magma chamber deep beneath the super volcano caldera is full of radioactive molten rock, scientists have shockingly revealed. This, is, this sounds to me like the basis of a, a fantastic B movie. So I, I, if there's any aspiring producers out there, run with this, please. This is fantastic. <laughs> Another resource that just came online in the last year and I think is spectacular. And if you haven't checked this out, you got to check it out. It's from the Wyoming State Geologic Survey. They are outstanding when it comes to geologic maps and especially putting all this information online. And in the last year, they introduced the Geology of Yellowstone map. This is an online digital map. You can go to their homepage and they have a whole list of interactive maps. And one of them is Yellowstone. And a tremendous amount of information is right there at your fingertips. You can look at the geologic maps of Yellowstone that have been produced over time. You can look at the locations of thermal features. You can find monitoring stations. You can see where earthquake uh, activity has occurred over different time periods. You can find where samples have been collected and even links to the data that tell you what the gas composition was from the Brimstone Basin or, or wherever. All of that information is contained in this Geology of Yellowstone online interactive map. It's an amazing achievement that they've done. And if you haven't checked it out, I, I urge you to, to go have fun with it. It's one of these rabbit holes on the internet where you can spend all day clicking around and, and learning new things about Yellowstone. We're also trying to put out some additional products. One is an annual report. Uh, you can see the 2017 one here, 2018 is out as well. 2019 will be out in a week or two, and our aim is to have the 2020 report done by May of this year. So we have sort of a summary of how many earthquakes there have been, the deformation that's happened, some of the research that's been done. So in a 30 or 40 page report that's got lots of figures and, and photos and illustrations, we're trying to tell the story of what happened in Yellowstone in a given year and, and what we've done. We've also started putting out a monthly video update and I'll play the opening for you here from one from a, a year and a half ago or so. Hi everybody, I'm Mike Poland, the scientist in charge of the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, and I'm coming to you today from the Upper Geyser Basin in Yellowstone National Park with the activity update for October of 2019. One of the things I started to realize when I, I got into this job was that people love videos. And so this was another way for us to reach out and talk to the public, to tell them about the sort of earthquake activity that had occurred in Yellowstone over the previous month. To talk about the ground deformation, ground moving up and down, what, what's been, been happening. To talk about geyser activity, how often is steamboat erupted and, and how can we see what's been going on at steamboat and, and other geysers in the region. 
And then we always close each one by saying, if you have any questions, you, you can write to us. And I found this is an effective way of reaching even more people who may not want to sit down and look at a 40 page, you know, glossy report about what happened in Yellowstone. And we're just like, to know is activity normal or, or not and what exciting things or interesting things are happening. So we try to put those out at the beginning of, of every month as well. And finally, there's always just contacting us directly. The USGS Volcanoes is on social media. So you can get us on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. We put out Caldera Chronicles and our, our monthly updates that way. But all of our partner institutions have these, these websites and, and social media feeds as well, like the University of Utah Seismograph Stations. You can sign up and they will tweet out every time there are major earthquakes or earthquakes of, of really any significant size in a region or the Idaho Geological Survey. You can get information on earthquakes in Idaho and research that they do in the Yellowstone region. And then finally, I love talking Yellowstone. I, I love talking volcanoes. And if you have questions, I always encourage people just write to YVO, YVO web team at usgs.gov is our address. And we, we answer every, every message we get because this is exciting. We, we want to share our excitement with, with everyone because Yellowstone is, is such an exciting, dynamic place. Uh, it's, it's not something that, that should, be, should be bottled up. So if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them anytime by, uh, by email or however any other method you, you want to use, you know, passenger pigeon or, or, or social media or wherever you like. So, uh, with that, I guess I'd like to thank you for allowing me to, to come into your homes and, and talk about Yellowstone, and I'd be happy to take uh, any questions you might have. Well, thank you, Mike. That was, um, that was really a very interesting talk, and we do have lots of questions. Uh, the first one is a softball. The second one's a hardball. <laughs> okay, bring it on. So the softball is a fellow ASU alum would like to know who you studied under there. So uh, studied under, sorry, at, at Davis or at Arizona State? At Arizona State. Arizona State, my, um, my advisor was a guy named uh, Jonathan Fink. Um, and he was a specialist in how lava, um, lava domes, especially uh, like at Mount St. Helens. And in fact, um, uh, I'm living now in the Portland area and, and he's a, a professor at Portland State University. So we still get to, to work together. Fantastic. Sorry, I'm trying to just uh, move my husband out of the frame here. All right, now what's a hardball? <laughs> The hardball is, what is your view on the Newbury trend? Um, ah. Yeah. Ah, yeah, that is a hardball. I, I intentionally did not show what's going on the other direction from, uh, from that, that you know, caldera that starts sort of in northern Nevada and uh, southern Idaho and, and, and southern Oregon. There is a trend of volcanism that goes from about that spot to Newbury caldera, and it gets younger going in that direction. Uh, I don't have a clue. <laughs> I, I hate to say that, but there are so many ideas out there for what that might be, that there's some funny stuff happening with the subducted Farallon plate uh, beneath the surface sort of rolling back in on itself and allowing sort of this propagation of material in the other direction, um, that there's some, some sort of tear in the old plate. Uh, and, and really just in the last few years, the amount of evidence that, that's grown to suggest that the Yellowstone hotspot is actually much older than we might think has to factor into this as well. Um, there is more and more evidence that the, hot, the Yellowstone hotspot is well over 50 million years old and it started someplace off the coast of North America. And there's evidence for it traversing Northern California, Northern Nevada, and then going quiet for a little while before it really got restarted about 17 million years ago with big eruptions of lava and the Columbia River basalts, and then these calderas that march their way toward the Yellowstone. So there is a huge amount of uncertainty with this kind of tectonic picture. Uh, and, and the Newberry trend is one of them. And I, I don't have a really good feel for what that is. I, I, I enjoy reading about it because I, I need to leave that to smarter people to understand what that might be. All right, well, that was the hard ball. So I think they're gonna get easier from here. <laughs> um, could you describe what a large hydrothermal explosion in Mary Bay might look like if somebody were actually standing there watching it? Uh, the largest geyser eruption you've ever seen. Um, that it's, it, it would be, it, it's water flashing to steam, but it is enough water flashing to steam that you're creating a crater that's a mile and a half across. That will generate a, a really large plume 
of, of, uh, of uh, gas and, and ash that's going to go into the air. And it will also generate little flows of ash that come off of this. You're throwing so much rock into the, to the air that it's a, it's a small, it's not quite a volcanic eruption because there's no magma that is directly coming out of the ground. It's a phreatic eruption and these steam blasts. But it would be incredibly hazardous. If you were standing right next to it, you wouldn't survive. Uh, there, this, this material has been traced out for several kilometers away from the eruption site. So this is the sort of thing that if it happened in Yellowstone today at a time when there were tourists um, in, the, in the area, it would be extremely hazardous. Um, fortunately, the really, really big ones seem to have sort of gotten less and less uh, uh, frequent over time. The last really big one was about 3,000 years ago. Um, but still, I, I think these small ones, these sort of like pork chop geyser, I mean, it blew up. And there's a boardwalk that goes right next to pork chop. And if you happen to be standing in the wrong place at the wrong time, even a, even a small hydrothermal explosion could, could ruin your whole day. <laughs> yeah. Um, another question, what is the minimum magnitude to be considered an earthquake for counting purposes? For example, uh -huh. the 1718 in 2020. Ah, uh, good question. So the minimum earthquake size to be counted is really one that can be located. So in some places, you that, that seismic map of, of Yellowstone uh, where all the stations were, but there's a lot of stations you can locate very small earthquakes. In fact, earthquakes can have negative magnitudes. This is a logarithmic scale. So, uh, so the, the zero is kind of arbitrary. So you can have negative magnitude earthquakes and the University of Utah locates negative magnitude earthquakes pretty regularly. In places where we don't have good coverage, say the southwest corner of Yellowstone, the Pitcherstone Plateau, there's really only one seismic station. The magnitude of completeness means that you won't get those really small earthquakes. So the magnitude of completeness is, I think, 1.5, meaning that in the Yellowstone area, anything of magnitude 1.5, regardless of where it is, will be locatable by the seismic network. So that's sort of the, the minimum magnitude for the area to be seen, but in some places we can see smaller. And um, with regard to the ground level moving up and down, does the Norris always go up when other areas are going down and vice versa? So is it, is it or does, do they sometimes go up and down in unison? That's a good question. So it appears from some of the recent uh, data, especially from 2013 on, that they kind of do the opposite thing. Like when Norris was going up in 2013, 2014, Caldera was going down. And then right when Norris reversed itself, 2014 went down, the Caldera seemed to have gone up. And then the Caldera started going down in 2015 and shortly thereafter Norris started going up. So there's a hint of that, but it's not perfect. Uh, right now, both are either not doing anything or, or going down. Uh, there were other time periods where Norris and the Caldera were both going down at the same time or, or doing nothing. So um, both conditions seem to be possible. And I think we don't quite have enough yet to say when Norris is really moving, whether or not the Caldera is doing the opposite. But it, it appears at least on, on the, the data we have that sometimes yes, which is really interesting, might suggest that there's some fluid exchange between the areas, but sometimes no. So clearly there's a, a bigger story there. All right, and another question, um, how much CO2 is released on an annual basis and how does that compare to other volcanoes like Hawaii and Mount yeah. Etna? Good question. Um, I don't know the CO2 emission rate for Etna off the top of my head. Hawaii, I do know because I spent a lot of time there. Um, typically Hawaii was, I think on the order of, uh, oh geez, I hope I get this right now, 10,000 tons a day, sounds, sounds about right. Wow. Um, and it fluctuates a little bit over time. It depends on how much magma is coming into the system. Uh, Yellowstone, it's incredibly hard to measure because it's coming out of every place. Uh, and, and so we don't have a measurement. And the nice thing about Kilauea in Hawaii, it's coming out of the summit. And, and for a while before the system changed a bit, we could, we could measure it with some degree of confidence. Um, we don't have that sort of setup at Yellowstone because it, it's coming out of the ground all over the place. The best estimate comes from many, many years ago, and it was something on the order of like 35,000 tons a day, I think. 
three times what was coming out of Hawaii from coming out of Kilauea. So it looks like the amount coming out of Yeltsin is, is prodigious, um, in, in, especially when you compare it to some place like, like Hawaii. But there are big error bars on that. And, and actually, that's one of the things that I would most like to study, or I'm not a gas geochemist. I'm not very good at chemistry. But I'd like to advocate for, I guess, is, is a better understanding of CO2, because the carbon dioxide emissions are tied directly to how much magma is coming into the system. That's what's bringing this, this carbon dioxide in. So a better handle on CO2 will help us see into the subsurface uh, in, in a different way than, than we've been able to. So I'm, I'm sort of excited to, to be able to do that sort of thing. And some of the technological advances suggest that you know, we might not be too far off from being able to take a stab at that. All right. So I think you, you sort of addressed this in your talk, but uh, what is your personal view, I guess, on what caused Steamboat to restart in 2018? And how do you think, how long do you think it'll continue to <laughs> run? Uh, I suspect it started up because um, Jake Lowenstern left the position and I, I succeeded him and it'll last as long as I'm in charge of YBO, right? <laughs> I, man, I, I suspect it's got to do with the plumbing system and these conduits opening and closing. You know, the, the hot water, it, you can tell from all the silica center that's deposited, you know, well, if you've ever had a, your car parked at Steamboat when an eruption happened, this deposit on your car, that stuff is in the water and it's precipitating out and, and filling these conduits. And, and, and so the, the water's constantly having to find their new ways to move around. So I suspect we see Steamboat and other geysers, not just Steamboat, Giant Geyser does something similar where it turns on and, and off. Right now it's it's turned off. Uh, that um, it's the, the plumbing system sort of having to reorient themselves from time to time. How long will it last? Well, oh man, you know, the 60s, it lasted seven odd years before it sort of leveled out. Um, I hope it lasts as long as possible because it's it's unbelievable. If you've seen it, it's unbelievable. And I, I hope more people get a chance to see it. So um, I hope it keeps going. <laughs> it's going to end someday. It's going to end someday. But I hope more of us get to see it before it does. So uh, the next question, I think, again, I think the intent here is, I think you answered it. But is there any intent to monitor and develop imaging? And I think it means um, geophysical imaging similar to what has been done at Old Faithful mm -hmm. at and around Steamboat. Yes. And I said that there is. Yeah, the that, that, that's been done by, so the, this, the team from the University of Utah deployed seismometers in 2018 and 2019, all around the, the Steamboat area. And they've had preliminary looks at the data uh, and it's spectacular. They can see different frequencies of ground vibrations that turn on and off at different times that might suggest water moving around in the subsurface in different ways or boiling happening in places where maybe it wasn't happening. But it's incredibly hard to uh, pour through these data because you put out, you know, 20 seismometers and then you have every possible combination of how all of those seismometers interact with one another. It's uh, the, the, nowadays with, with geophysical data, it's like drinking out of a fire hose. It, it's, it's difficult to keep track of all of the things that we're recording. So it, it takes a while to, to call through all this and, and develop uh, sort of a model for what we're seeing. But I think, I think they're, they're actively working on this. And I'm, I'm pretty excited you know, in the coming year or so to hear what their experiments from 18 and 19 have, have uh, resulted in. All right. Yeah, I mean, my background's in oil and gas and we use a lot of geophysical imaging. So I think that's pretty exciting and fun I, stuff. One of the things I think is sort of funny, ironic about this, and in, in talking with with Jamie Farrell and other the seismologists at Utah, is that um, they now have a couple of recordings of what Steamboat looked like when it's really active. Well, no one ever went and deployed seismometers to Steamboat when it wasn't active, and so we actually don't know what Steamboat looks like normally, right, when it's not erupting, and so we don't have that baseline, which is really kind of funny. Um, in order to really see how things have changed, we might need to do a deployment when steamboats not erupt. In the future, yeah. Yeah, so it, it's, a bit, it's a bit odd to think about, you know, and, and this is one of the, the challenges maybe in, in, in Yellowstone. You know, if you're gonna study a geyser, you go to a place like Old Faithful, or Lone Star, or someplace that's erupting consistently, because you know you're gonna get a signal. You wouldn't deploy in steamboat in 2015 because 
you could go all summer and record nothing. But now looking back on it, it would help to have the nothing because it would help you to interpret something that we have now. That makes sense. <laughs> all right, uh, we still have a lot of questions to go. So uh, on your thermal image of the, the new thermal area in Turn uh -huh. Lake area, sorry, a lot of areas there. Uh, what is the temperature range from yellow to red to white? Uh, it's so on that thermal image from the from the helicopter where it was kind of pink and, and I think the hottest temperatures were like 80 C and the lowest temperatures were background. Um, it was there was an August day when we did it. So, you know, 20, 20 degrees or so. But when we landed and, and, and got out and, and we're walking around in the thermal area, we had a, a thermal probe and we stuck it just below the ground, five centimeters below the surface, we hit 93, 94 degrees, which is boiling at, at that elevation. So, and, and those, those pixels that you're getting when you're above are sort of averaging things. So it was boiling. It was boiling just beneath the, the surface. Oh, wow. Um, how old and large is Pitchstone Plateau compared to other flows? I, I'm shooting from the hip here, but I think I'm right that pitchstone is the youngest lava flow in Yellowstone. And so that one is about 70,000 years old. Uh, and there has been nothing since either inside or just outside the caldera. So pitchstone's the youngest flow. And it's big, it's, uh, I can't remember exactly, but it's tens of cubic kilometers. I mean, it's, it's a huge flow. All of those big rhyolite flows that erupted in that sequence from about 170 to 70,000 years ago are, are just massive lava flows. Um, oh, here's one related to your jokes at the end. Are many of the hot springs radioactive like Cuckleberry? <laughs> Probably to an extent they all are because there uh, is all kinds of interesting material on them, but I guess I'm not worried about turning into a zombie killer freak by, you know, taking a dip in the boiling river or anything like that. All right, so from the perspective uh, on how Yellowstone has formed and works. Could you comment on the most recent Yellowstone volcanism way out on the Snake River Plain at Craters of the Moon about 2000 years ago, years in age? Yeah, so there is this sort of trailing amount of, of volcanism that's, that's following along in the wake of the hotspot. And I don't know that we have a super good feel for exactly what's going on there. Some of this may be basaltic magma that's kind of slipping out of the Yellowstone area related to the, to the hotspot, relict uh, left over. Some, and, and it may be enhanced the ability to get to the surface by the fact that the whole Western US is, is thinning uh, because of this extension that's occurring basically from the Sierra Nevada to the Wasatch and the Teton ranges. Uh, and, and so it, it makes it a little bit easier for, for magma to get to the surface. So it's, it's related to Yellowstone in that uh, it, it has the, the, uh, some of the characteristics of, of Yellowstone and, and it's, it's there because the Yellowstone material passed by, but it's not uh, completely, it's not one-to-one -one related to the magma system that lies beneath Yellowstone today. So it, it's, it's, an, it's an odd system and it, it is an interesting system that it erupts every, you know, uh, two or 3,000 years, and the last eruption was, was 2,000 years ago. So it's, uh, you know, when I think about places that uh, are more are most likely to to erupt, you know, th there's a lot of assumptions that we're, we're watching Yellowstone and, and, and monitoring it for signs of a, of a volcanic eruption there. It is far more likely by a lot that there's going to be a, a cinder cone that forms in Idaho or Arizona or Utah or New Mexico in Colorado than there would be a uh, any sort of magma reaching the surface in Yellowstone. So um, it's in Craters of the Moon is an interesting, spectacular place that uh, it's related to Yellowstone, but I think there's still some ambiguity about exactly how. All right, so we've got a biology question and then a chemistry question coming up. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is really gonna yeah, test okay. you. Octopus Hot Springs has living stromatolites. Are there other living stromatolites, I guess, in the park? Uh, so I got to go to a spot. Um, it wasn't, I'm pretty sure it's not octopus, although 
I, I can't remember the name of it offhand right now. It's sort of in the mud volcano area. I'm kind of behind mud volcano where, yeah, I, I got to see some of these stromatolites. So if that's not octopus, then yes, there's that area as, as well. Um, but yeah, it, it's the, the whole life in Yellowstone thing, the, the, the thermobiological stuff, which Montana State does to an absurdly incredible degree. Uh, the, the studies that they do there are, are unbelievable. Um, the, the stories there are, are amazing. The, what we're learning about life in general. One, the one thing that I didn't, didn't realize was that this, this one type of, of bacteria, Thermus aquaticus, which was discovered in the 60s in a Yellowstone hot spring, is now the basis for the PCR testing that tells us whether or not we might have COVID. That is something that is, you know, developed over the, the years and Nobel prizes were, were given out because of it. But it was because a, a researcher sampled this, this bacterium in, in Yellowstone in the, in the late 60s. And um, I think that's a wonderful argument too for the importance of basic research. You know, when, when, when the researchers took this sample, they didn't foresee that it was gonna be helping us identify viruses in the human body 60 years down the line, 50 years down the line. But Look what we've look what we've learned from this, and 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 thank goodness that that, that work was done and and propagated over the years to, to to give us that capability. All right. Well, do you uh, know what the cation usually associated with the chloride in the water is? I don't. Um, there's a reason I'm a geophysicist and not a <laughs> geochemist. Um, I know what a cation is. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I, I don't, but um, I can I can look that up. And uh, there's also, I, I believe you'll find, if you, you do some Google searches on chloride flux in Yellowstone, there's some reports uh, that various um, USGS and National Park Service scientists have put out uh, on the chloride flux method. It's been around for, for quite a while. And one of the things I think is very neat about, about this is the way they would used to tell how much chloride was in the water was to directly sample it. But they found that the amount of chloride in the water is actually proportional to the, condu the uh, conductance of the water, the conductivity of the water. And so by measuring this conductivity, they can kind of use that as a proxy, proxy for, for chloride. And so now you don't have to take that direct sample. You can do a, a continuous geophysical measurement, which is much easier, uh, and, and then radio that information out and get a sense of whether or not chloride is changing. And, and they have seen spikes in chloride when you know geysers erupt and a bunch of fresh hot water passes by this, the sensors. So um, it's now done as kind of a proxy method um, instead of directly sampling, which has allowed us to do it continuously. All right, so next question is, are there tsunamis in Yellowstone Lake? Mm. Uh, well, I am not aware of any deposits that would, that would be tsunami related. It's difficult to believe that when Mary Bay formed, there wouldn't have been some waves. Um, there also are some uh, hydrothermal explosion craters on the floor of Yellowstone Lake. Um, Elliott Crater is perhaps the, the largest and, and best known. Um, and that one, when it formed, must have generated some, some nice waves as well. So I imagine that, yeah, there are, but I'm not offhand aware of geologic evidence for them. Um, there are some really cool waves that, that happen on Yellowstone Lake. And this was discovered by folks that work uh, with UNAVCO, this group in Boulder, and some, some researchers who at the time were at the USGS and, and a woman named Karen Luttrell, who's now down at, at Louisiana State. They looked at a seiche, which is sort of like a very long-term wave that gets generated on Yellowstone Lake. It's sort of amplitude of tens of centimeters, but the period is many minutes to hours. And that changes the load of water over time. And that load was detected by very sensitive instruments called strain meters, which are installed in boreholes in, in Yellowstone. There's four or five of them that are, that are active right now. And so by detecting, knowing the load that was shifting around in the lake and being able to measure the strain that that caused, this team could actually tell sort of something about the viscosity of the magma chamber and realized that most of it was, was solid because uh, it wasn't perfectly, you know, like everything was solid. Uh, there must've been some molten material, but it wasn't like it was completely molten. I thought, God, what a, what a cool study, taking the shifting load of lake water and being able to use it to 
identify something about the magma chamber. So no, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, do you think there's a connection between the start of the Yellowstone, the start of the Yellowstone system, and the initiation of basin and range extension? Mm. Good question. Uh, I guess based on the stuff that I've been reading just recently about this, uh, that basin and range extension started after the Yellowstone hotspot began. So the Yellowstone hotspot may have started over 55 million years ago, somewhere offshore of California, Northern California. Um, now, how much then might the Yellowstone hotspot have contributed to basin and range extension? Well, that's kind of an interesting question. So it might be that when the hotspot got into the area that's now the basin and range and interacted with this old Farallon plate and, and all of the mess of the tectonic mess that was sort of underneath that area, that it helped contribute to starting basin and range extension. I think that's sort of a, a reasonable idea. Um, one of the things that I, I thought was really quite a neat idea, you know, you can see the trail of calderas that goes back to northern Nevada very clearly, and then there's, there's not much. And so for a long time, the, the idea had been, well, the Yellowstone hotspot arrived at the surface 17 million years ago when the Columbia River basalts came out, this huge eruption, lava flows that went from, you know, Idaho all the way to the Pacific Ocean, uh, and that's when the hotspot started. Well, now the thinking is that the Farallon plate was sort of blocking the hotspot from making it up to the surface. And so there was a few million year period where there was no hotspot volcanism because everything was sort of stacking up underneath the Farallon plate, which was, was blocking the path to the surface. And eventually something broke and all of that accumulated stuff came out all at once. And that was the Columbia River basalts. So that wasn't necessarily the first event in the hotspot. It was something that was kind of in the middle of the hotspot, but it was because it was all getting sort of backed up that we had that big outpouring and then the, the trail of calderas. So all of this stuff is probably interrelated in some sense, but it's not as simple as, as one causing the other directly. I think it, you have to factor in the, the, the weird, uh, you know, lower crust upper mantle stuff that's going on beneath the basin and range too. Um, why is the Snake River Plain so aseismic compared to Yellowstone, particularly since the hotspot went through the eastern Snake River Plain? Good question, and I, I don't have a good answer. Um, this would be the sort of thing that, that Bob Smith, who I, I know is, is you know, right in your neck of the woods, would probably be able to answer at the drop of a pin. Um, so I, I, I guess I don't feel comfortable speculating. Um, it, it probably has something to do with the fact that it sort of blew up this whole track of material and left a, a warm trace behind it. Um, but I, I don't have a, a concrete answer. I would, I would defer to, to Bob and, and colleagues at the University of Utah that have really studied that. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what part of your talk this refers to, but are you suggesting that the amount of CO2 emission could be an indicator of future eruptions? Uh, in so, at some volcanoes, yes. Um, we have seen, so, you know, I'd spent all this 10 years of my career in Hawaii. And prior to uh, a, a change in the way Kilauea behaved in the mid 2000s, there was a big pulse of CO2 that came out of the ground. It was as if, so we know that the CO2 is sort of carried by the magma and, and, and they, they correlate. So it was as if the CO2 beat the magma to the surface. And if we could detect these plumes of CO2, we might be able to detect changes in just how much magma was coming in. Um, this has since been seen in other places. Uh, Etna, I believe, is one place where it's been observed. Um, one of my colleagues measured it in Alaska. There was a big plume of CO2 that came out of a readout volcano several months before readout started to get restless and erupt. So I think CO2 has tremendous value as a volcano monitoring tool in places. Um, it's hard to measure because there's so much of it in the atmosphere already. So you're sort of, and, and frankly, there's more and more every, every year. You know, the, the, we're now at sort of 400 parts per million CO2 or whatever, and you might be looking for a signal that's 402 parts per million or 410 or something like that. So it's pretty hard to measure. Um, if we were to see big changes at Yellowstone, I think it'd be a difficult thing to interpret because clearly 
a huge amount of CO2 has been coming out of Yellowstone for a long time and no magma has come out of the ground in 70,000 years. So I don't know that it's gonna be a great indicator for future eruptive activity in Yellowstone, especially because we're gonna be measuring this much in a time period that's immense. But we gotta start understanding the CO2 budget and how it varies over time and then try to relate that back to what might be happening in the subsurface. I don't think we're, we, we aren't even ready to, to put the pieces together in the same way that we have in places like Kilauea or Etna or Redout. Interesting. Um, quick question here, is there a day-night correlation on steamboat eruptions or are they random with respect to day and night? I am not aware of a day-night correlation. Um, I, I'm trying to think back to this study that was just, just published. Um, if you're interested in, in, in reading this study, it's, it's open to everyone. It's in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, I, I'm pretty sure they didn't find anything that was sort of day-night. Sometimes to me, it felt like it was, there was a correlation because every time I went there, it would only erupt at night and I'd miss it. But I, I think that was just bad luck on my part. Uh, another quick question, are you, in, are you instrumenting Turn Lake? Um, no, not at present. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is we try to be very careful about the instruments that we uh, put in the park. Um, Yellowstone is a wonderland and it's something that all of us as geologists uh, really respect and want to preserve. And so there's a, a, a concern about, you know, making sure that we respect the, the environment and not just go sort of throwing instruments out every place we, we can. Um, but then the other reason is that it's actually easier to monitor remotely. Um, Space-based monitoring is what discovered it in the first place. And so this is something we do all the time. We can track the overall temperature and variations in temperature from space. And we can track changes in vegetation cover from space or, or from air. And some of those high resolution views, I mean, the, the one of the, the Palisade feature uh, down in the Beckler area um, going dry, I mean, that was from space. That image was from space and the pixel sizes are less than a meter. So we can see it from space in many ways better than we can see it from the ground and more consistently. So in some places, it's actually better to use satellites to monitor for a variety of reasons than it is to have something on the ground, especially something that's so remote that maintaining an instrument, especially in kind of the harsh environment that we have, you know, Yellowstone winters would be, would be pretty challenging. All right. Uh, well, so this is actually an offer, not a question. Um, and, and I'm not going to actually attribute it. It's from Bob Smith, who apparently is on the line. Uh, and he says, I can send geologists of Jackson Hole images of one, the Norris magmatic source and the caldera magmatic body to my 1984 aerial image of a steamboat geyser and three a summary figure showing time series of decades of seismic activity deformation in and outside the caldera and how they all relate bob so actually offered me his figure of uh the hotspot track which also throw which also showed the newberry track as well and i said you know bob i, I love this figure but i think i'm just going to stick with the the one that, that shows the hotspot track for Yellowstone because the Newberry spot is such a confusing thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we weren't gonna let you get away with that one. Yeah, uh, Bob, and, and, he, and the guy was lucky enough to be in an airplane above Steamboat when it was erupting. I mean. I know, incredible. Well, he gave a talk and he showed that picture. <laughs> um, okay, we still have more questions, it. so hang in there, guys. Uh, so this one's not, not a, question it was sort of a question um we'd love to have you back for another talk <laughs> maybe in person <laughs> yeah that'd be nice we're looking for there won't be that. a government shutdown or a pandemic or some other crazy thing <laughs> um here's another geology question does the yellowstone river predate the lava flow cliffs in the grand canyon of yellowstone and are there any time color correlations with the river and the lava flows uh i i don't know um offhand I believe uh, a tremendous amount of that river was, was carved out in, since the last ice age because there were some uh, 
uh, ice dams that, that formed and caused the river to back up. I mean, Hayden Valley is Hayden Valley because it was sort of turned into a lake because of these ice dams that, that had formed, you know, uh, in the last ice age, you know, uh, 15 to 25,000 years ago, somewhere in that, in that range. So I think an awful lot of that canyon formed by gouging from these big floods that came through when the ice dam failed. Um, but uh, I, I, I don't know that there's really much of a sense of what it would have looked like before the lava flows were in that area. Um, but a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff you're seeing is post-glacial um, last 15,000 years. That's an interesting aspect of, of Yellowstone. You, you figure the, the slate was sort of wiped clean um, uh, down to 15,000 years ago. So what, what did the geyser basins look like when they were covered with ice or when the ice finally receded? Um, we don't have any record of hydrothermal explosions before 15,000 years ago because the ice obliterated all the evidence that might have existed. So the surface at Yellowstone, for the most part, is pretty young because the ice took away all of the, the things that might have been there before, hydrothermal explosion craters, thermal areas. And, and so what we're seeing now is, is geologically, you know, very, very, very recent. Yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Um, okay, it looks like our resident chemist, Mike Schur, has answered the cation question. <laughs> is he going to tell me what a cation is? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, he probably can. Um, so he says it's probably sodium, magnesium, or calcium, and maybe some potassium. So there you go. Sounds good to um, me. And then Thank are you. you in contact with the NSAS scientists, scientists that has proposed drilling a well into Yellowstone to reduce the pressure? So, so this was uh, an idea that came up like one of my first months on the job. Um, and the, the story was that there was a, a NASA panel that was looking at global disasters and kind of, you know, what are the odds that a, a, a meteor will hit the earth and, and cause untold devastation and what can we do about it? And they, they did some calculations and decided a really big Yellowstone sized volcanic eruption was more likely to occur than a, a meteor hitting the earth. And, and they sort of did some really back of the envelope calculations. Well, could we, could we drill a hole and pump water into the magma system and cool it down? Uh, and they, they decided that they could, it would generate energy, which might help pay for this massive project, but it would take like 10,000 years. Um, they missed a few things on their calculations, one of which was there's a constant input of heat. So you're sort of constantly, you're never going to, it's not static. It's not like we start with this ball of magma that's at a certain temperature and you're going to cool it down because there's nothing coming to the bottom. So it'd be sort of like trying to constantly pour a little bit of water into a tea kettle that's on high on your stove. I mean, good luck. Um, it's going to take 10,000 years. I mean, how many category five hurricanes are going to hit the Gulf Coast in the next 10,000 years? So <laughs> the, the whole thing I, I thought was a bit silly. And I, I thought as a thought exercise, hey, cool. Um, but it was never a plan. And that gets reported a lot. It's one of these games of telephones where this sort of back of the envelope calculation became a NASA plan. And it was never a plan. It was sort of just like a, a thought exercise that then got emailed to the BBC and, and, and sort of got a, a lot of press. But there was never a realistic um, idea that this was actually going to happen. Um, drilling at Yellowstone is, is it, it, see, it makes sense. It seems like, well, a water and cool down or, or pipe something in and relieve the pressure. But it physically just doesn't work. For a, for a variety of, of reasons. So, and, and besides, I mean, if we did that, we would destroy the thermal features at Yellowstone. Um, there's a lot of places on Earth where holes have been drilled to do geothermal energy, and the geysers that are nearby have turned off. And, uh, mm. you know, I, I think that would be, that would be tough to, to sort of, you know, drill a hole that's not going to do any good and is not necessary. And because of that, Old Faithful stops erupting. I, yeah, no, I, so. I would not be. But, it's, but, but it's, but it's a very, it, I think it's a very common question because conceptually it makes sense. But uh, this, this NASA plan was sort of just kind of like somebody drawing equations on a cocktail napkin and it doesn't quite fit in the real world. All right. Uh, so I think, thank you for spending so much time answering all these questions. Sure. <laughs> Obviously it was, 
quite an informative talk and generated a lot of interest. So thank you again. And I just want to take this opportunity to remind our audience before everybody leaves that we're now doing two talks a month. We're doing two in um, March, the first by John Heberger on energy transition and the second by myself and Mike Schur on the, the limestones and dolomites of the Teton area and their fossils. And uh, then we also have the Teton native plants talk next Tuesday. So it's a series of, of Tuesday talks and hopefully you can all join in on those. And once again, huge thanks, Mike, for generating so much interest and what a great, well, you know, talk about our, the geology in our backyard, so. Well, thanks so much for having me. I, I really uh, enjoyed talking to a, a group of uh, geologists and uh, uh, hopefully we can do it sometime again in, in person. <laughs> That'd be great. Look forward to that.